I'm here with Michael Cartwright, a former student of mine, and I uh, asked him to join me today. I'd like to discuss some things because Michael did kind of something different. He went to California for a long time, and all of a sudden, he's not in California anymore. He's in North Dakota, specifically yes. Center, North Dakota. Michael, welcome. I appreciate taking your time and, and letting me interview to you today. Absolutely, Michael. It's good to be here. I'm excited that you're doing some good stuff. Well, thanks. So we go like way, way back, like back in the late 90s, you were one of my students all through high school. And then you graduated and moved on and you went to California. And now you're here in North Dakota. What prompted that move? Well, after 20 years of living in Southern California and being a musician out there, um, I was spending every weekend on the road with the band that I was working with. And the weekdays were just kind of getting a little, little bit lost. I, you know, I, I wasn't 18, 19, 20 years old anymore, hanging out with all my friends. Uh, everybody grew up and got married and had kids, but I continued on with my music life and I figured I just needed something to change. I needed something to uh, to kind of re-energize me. And I was kind of getting beat down by the Southern California lifestyle. So I took over my grandparents' old farmhouse here in uh, Center, North Dakota. And I still travel with my band on the weekends. I just meet them at the venue uh, when we have our gigs. And uh, North Dakota has actually been pretty kind to me. I'm currently... Uh, the co-host of a morning show here in North Dakota. I'm, it's kind of, I call it the North Dakota version of Regis and Kathy Lee. And then I also uh, do some bartending in the evenings. And uh, yeah, I'm, in, I'm enjoying my time. So this, this show that you're, is it radio or is it TV? It's TV. It's on our local CBS station. Nice. It's called Studio 701. So yeah, I'm on every other morning um, at 9 a.m. Central Time. It streams if anybody would ever want to watch us uh, talk to talk about North Dakota lifestyle. Oh, and well, that's all awesome. things involved in that. Yeah, I'll get the well, I'll get the link from you and I'll put it in the remarks. Section. Wonderful. So so let's go back. You're in California. You're a working musician in California. You mm -hmm. were playing all the time. What was that like? I mean, California life is stressful and you're scraping by or were you successful as a musician? I would actually say I was pretty successful. Um, I was playing usually about four nights a week, three to four nights a week and uh, traveling on the weekends with a uh, event band and which I still do. So I fly out and I do corporate parties, weddings, things like that in the nation and abroad. Um, and also I was playing a couple nights a week at local bars and clubs, as well as teaching um, a basic music theory class at a performing arts college. So my life became completely music all the time. And, you know, I would like to say I was doing pretty well. You know, I bought a car and had a nice apartment, 10 minutes walk from the ocean and, and things were doing well. And so I would consider my time in California a success. Um, I did take an acting class once in, uh, in my younger thirties and the acting teacher told me something I'll never forget. He said, you know, you've made it in California when you don't have to live here anymore. <laughs> so that kind of made sense to me. Um, and so I got out of California living wise, yet I still am there maybe once a month doing gigs. Yeah. So I'm yeah. kind of living the best of both worlds in a time, in a way. Interesting. So, so you say, you said that you're, in North Dakota now, you're a, a TV host and you're working as a bartender. What about music? What do you, besides, you said you travel to play with your band on a regular basis and stuff like that. What about music itself? Are you performing up in that area? You said you're, you're not that far from Bismarck. Are you doing any gigs or is it all your stuff is when you travel and meet your band and do your corporate things? So good news is, is I found a small group of very talented musicians here in Bismarck. So I do have a solid rhythm section um, of great guys that age from 27 to 72, literally. Wow. So it's a very mixed band. Um, so we get together every couple of months and we do a, a big show at, the, at a local pub 
we do classic R&B, things like that. And the cool thing is, is no one was doing that type of music up here. So when we have shows, we're packing 200 plus people into this venue, and which is amazing. Yeah. Uh, so that's the perk. Uh, the the, the kind of con about being in middle of nowhere, North Dakota, is there's a very small pool of musicians available. So I literally have one guy per instrument, and that's it. I got one bass player, I got one guitar player, keyboard, and that's it. So I'm kind of limited to extra things that I would want to do that would normally fit into my normal going out on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday night in LA and playing. Because in LA, I can just book a gig and then worry about my sidemen later. Right here, it's a very different situation. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I am finding other musical opportunities. I've played with the local Bismarck uh, Symphony Orchestra, oh, and I've done a couple other small kind of vignette things that I didn't expect to show up. So, yeah, there is music, but um, I would like there to be more players who are on my uh, same level. Well, that's it. okay. It's kind of interesting because you went from literally a teeny tiny minnow in the middle of the ocean to a big gigantic fish in a really, really small pond. Yes. And as you said, there's not a whole lot to pull from, is there, huh? No, no, there really isn't. So my name's gotten around pretty quick and I consider myself an overall entertainer and not just a trumpet player. So, I mean, I'm, I do singing gigs, I'll do teaching, playing horn, um, speaking at events, anything that involves my talents, I will gladly do. That's interesting. Okay, well, that's awesome, I think. I think that's, um, that's pretty cool that you were able to make that transition really, really well from, from the LA thing to the small town. So center North Dakota is about how many people? 500 people. And I live four miles outside of town. So oh, you I'm on. <laughs> you yeah. really went remote, didn't you? Yeah, my closest neighbor is a half mile away, and uh, I'm on 14 acres. Uh, that's my property land. That's awesome. I'm so glad that you were able to get that land and and do something about it, and and able to. Um, you said it's your grandpa's house, right? Yep. Yeah, my grandfather built this house with his two hands and his buddies back in I think '85. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So, so what's, so what kind of music would you consider yourself a performer of? I, it sounds to me like you do a little bit of everything. Is there a particular style of music that you prefer to play more than anything else? I mean, you know, do you prefer to play jazz? Would you would you consider it classic jazz or would you consider it smooth? What kind of music do you prefer to play? Yeah, good question. Well, preference, yes. For work, I play everything. For preference, um, I've kind of made up a, my own genre for me. Um, I like to call it saucy jazz or booty jazz. It may sound kind of funny. Uh, so I consider that... Um, Actually, what I like to do really fits into what is the modern day jazz festival. You go to a modern day jazz festival and it's not just guys playing bebop. You'll have John Legend with a live band. You'll have, you know, you'll have uh, Branford Marsalis or something like that, you know, a big mix. So I love doing R&B pop music with extended solos. That's, that's my favorite thing to do because I'm a singer and a trumpet player. So I like to sing the chorus and then play play a couple times through the head you know okay well that's kind of interesting have you do you do you want to explore other kinds i mean you said you're playing in the local symphony and you're playing you know you're doing a little bit of everything do you so you really haven't pigeonholed yourself at all you're really diversified on everything you do would you agree Absolutely. I've really found for myself that I have a lot of interests and I also like variety doing. I think if I would have picked the same, if I would have just decided to be just a trumpet player, um, I'm sure I'd be a, a fantastic, amazing trumpet player with a great gig. I chose to diversify, which is what I really like to do. I like the variety um, and I can't do one thing for too long. And for example, you brought up the symphony. Um, the I played fourth trumpet for Ravel's Bolero okay. for the symphony. And this is my first time playing a symphonic gig since probably high school. And they put the sheet music down in front of me. And the first thing I see is 148 measures of rest. 
Yes. And I just went, <laughs> you know, so, so I, I, I reminded myself that this is great, but this is not the end all be all for me. So I think for me, just continuing to do variety and I'm starting to get more into the idea of really creating my own original music and seeing where that can go. So that's really the final frontier would be uh, original music and letting that out for the world. So, so speaking of original music, thank you for the segue. My next question has to do with that video you came out with a while back. It was a really great video. You had it up on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I thought it was gonna catch on and yet I, from my vantage point, now, you know, please remember when you brought that out, I was working full time as, as an air traffic controller. So my music career at that time was on, you know, zero. Um, where did it ever, whatever happened to that? Did it ever go anywhere? Did you ever get up on any of the contemporary jazz charts with it? Or did it just kind of sit there? I mean, let's be honest, you know, in today's musical society, unless you make an extreme big impact, things kind of go by the white side, whatever became of it. Yeah. So, um, I wouldn't say anything ever really became of it. I never really promoted it. I never sent it to people. Um, I just kind of let it float out on the internet. And, you know, when things are floating on the internet, who knows if they're going to get caught or not, you know? I didn't have any sort of management or label backing me up. I completely bankrolled the whole thing myself. So it, that's just kind of what it was. Um, and I enjoyed it, had a great time. And, uh, you know, in the future, we'll see what happens. You know, I definitely know that when you want to promote something like that, you you need assistance. If you don't have internet expertise, um, label support is great promotion because there's only so much I can do, you know, in one day, you need a team to really make something oh, yeah. go. No, no, no. I know that for I'm being the fact that I'm doing, um, I, I understand, let's just say I understand completely what you're talking about. Unless you have a marketing person, getting your name out there can be almost impossible. And, yeah. and you know, it's, it's not something you can do. That's why, you know, personally, I stepped away from, from running my own jazz group all those years ago, because I was doing it all. Um, you know, I was, I was creating the gigs, doing the promotions, trying to do this, trying to do that. I'm doing three, five, eight, 10, 12 things all at once. And all of a sudden, it was just extremely overwhelming. And at the time, you know, with the family and everything else, I had to make a choice. And yeah, absolutely. That it kind of, you know, being that it was not my vocation, it was my hobby. I was able to say, you know what, maybe it's time to step away for a while. And I did. And yeah. I understand that. I understand that concept without the without the help, without marketing. It's kind of hard to, to make it out there. I'll, I'll try to. I'll put your YouTube page link down in the uh, down in the uh, remarks section and maybe people will float on over there and see if they can enjoy the video because I thought it was done very, very well. Um, I thought that it was done very professionally. So my compliments to you on that. Hey, thank you. Um, so so what I guess at my my equipment nerd in me asks, yeah. so what type of equipment are you using nowadays? Um, without going into extreme detail um what kind of what kind of horn are you playing on are you are you still playing on i don't even remember what you had are you still playing on the same horn i think i had yeah, yeah when we were doing lessons together i remember we went through a big horn tryout process which i i i landed on a french besson yep trumpet they called it the new french besson and it had like two different lead pipes and heavy bottom bow, uh, valve caps and some right. stuff like that. So since then, um, since that horn, I actually ventured into vintage horns for a little while um, and have moved on from that. The actual trumpet that I'm using these days is a, uh, this is a uh, Edwards Gen 3. This is a kind of a atypical horn. It's kind of modeled after the whole Monet where they heavy wall everything. Yeah. Um, heavy bottom, heavy bottom valve caps. Uh, here's funny thing. The lead pipe is actually completely encased into a secondary sheet um, around the outside. So it's a very heavy horn. Um, it's it sounds lovely and fluffy, and it's got a big bold sound. Not really great for section work, but right. majority of things that I do are solo. Right. So this works out pretty great. 
And then um, I tend to rotate between three mouthpieces. My go-to is my Monette uh, B6, which is pretty much the size of a 3C. Mm -hmm. I've been using this one for, I bought this from the Monette factory in probably 2003. And then um, I have two varieties of GR mouthpieces. Oh, which uh, GR? Yeah, so this is the GR E65 FD. So this one, I actually make a lot of money off of this one because I play private parties all the time. I'm playing where I need a very light um, touch to it. So I got the flugelhorn cup mm -hmm. for a trumpet mouthpiece and I use this all the time. And then I have a somewhat of a lead version of this as well with a little shower cup. So that, that's it. Interesting, the GR, see I play GR mouthpieces. Mm -hmm. So I play the GR 66 series. Okay. So I play the um, the M, the MS, and the S. S is for lead, obviously. Yeah. And then I also have the matching flugelhorn, the 66 FL and the 66 FD. So the FD I use in my trumpet when I want this nice, big, fat, mellow sound. Yep. And it really, it's, it's beautiful for some of the work that I do. So I understand the FD concept. Yeah. Um, that's kind of cool that you work on. I, I've never, I've never done the Monet uh, mouthpieces. Uh, I started, you know, me, I used to play on the Bach three, uh, the Megatones for years mm -hmm. and years and years. And when I started, picked up my horn again, a couple of years ago, I decided, well, what I wanted something different. Yeah. Someone suggested the GR mouthpieces and I've just always been on, you know, you go to eBay and every once in a while you can find one. And I actually found the, the three and the 66. And I tried both of those. Mm -hmm. I didn't try the E65. Someone else had recommended I try that one and I didn't. And I tried the 3M and I tried the 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 uh, 66M and I went with the 66M. And I've been yeah. happy ever since. And I have a I have a whole collection of 66. I have the 66MX for my C trumpet. I have the 66VB coming for my for my C trumpet. I have a, uh, I don't even remember what it is. It's a six, I don't remember which one it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have a 66 for my E flat. And then I have a piccolo version, uh, the 66 piccolo version, uh, but I don't have a piccolo anymore. So it just sits there, but yeah. you know, that, that's okay. I love the GR mouthpieces. I really do. I like the way they play. Again, I haven't tried the Monette. I've been told I should. Um, but I really like the GR mouthpieces. So, well, good. At least we have something in common. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, GR mouthpieces, especially if you're, if you're into gear, you can really go head first into a rabbit hole with GR because there's so many variants, I know. you know, um, uh, I mean, you would, I don't know how somebody would, would really try them all out. I lucked out. I had a brass shop in Los Angeles that carried them. And so we kind of went through their stock to find something. Uh, that worked for me. So I'm glad I found it. Um, and yes, I, I tend to, I've had this Monet piece for a long time. And it's one that I'll leave for a while and then I'll come back to it, leave and come back. I haven't tried any Monet equipment in new, in Monet equipment in 20 years. So I don't know what kind of things they're doing now. So they, yeah. And, and, you know, their system, their, their system, if you understand their system, you can find a mouthpiece. I've, <laughs> excuse me. I've, I've always, like I said, I went with GR and I've been happy with the GR mouthpieces. So at least, like I said, at least we have something in common. I play a Yamaha uh, 6335 RC trumpet. Um, uh, it's actually, it's not available in the US. I had to order it from, from Europe, from the German factory. And I've been very, very happy with that. I still have my, my Bobby Shoe 6310Z Gen 1 horn that I got all those years ago that Bobby yeah. sent me. I still have that. I play it when I'm playing jazz and I stick that 66S in there. Yeah. And I don't have to blow my brains out to get up into those high registers. And it's very, very nice. That's right. That's right. All right. So, so here's my last question. So what now? So, so where are you going from here? Obviously you're staying there and you're doing all these things. Any, any goals, anything in particular that you're looking forward to, or you just kind of ride it out and see what happens? Absolutely. Well, I will definitely say I feel like I'm at a big turning point in my life. Um, one of the main reasons of moving here to North Dakota is because of the uh, living costs are so low 
that I was actually able to pay off my student loan debt that I gained from USC. I just paid that off two months ago. So now I'm 100% debt free, um, living in this beautiful place and kind of personally in my personal life looking for what's next in my professional life really looking for what's next i have i've kind of given myself uh, like the next two years period of time to kind of just be a little bit aimless and just uh follow the fun in life you know if i want to want to go on a uh, trip somewhere and and check something out do that well if i you know i'm just going to follow this tv uh morning show business for a while and see where that goes and and hopefully write some music along the way and and maybe something will really stick i definitely know that i don't want to spend every weekend of my life traveling or gigging which is what i've pretty much done for the last 15 years mm -hmm. and i feel like kind of been there done that and um you know i've i've missed a lot of birthday parties and and friends events and brunch and and all sorts of things that normal life happens on the weekends i've missed out on that and so i'd like to take part in that now so uh, big picture um if, if i'm gonna look at my uh my obituary uh from here on out i'll have written a couple couple albums uh a couple concept albums it sounds great um continue in my uh pursuit of it, uh learning how to hang glide i've started to learn how to hang glide oh, goodness and goodness. um you know buy a motorcycle and who knows if, if a wife and kids show up along that way i'll take that too but you know just just kind of living living on my own at the moment okay michael cartwright you can uh catch all of his information down below in the uh comment section and uh thank you for your time michael i appreciate it Hey, thank you, Michael. Good to see you today.